The Week in Doubt, episode 282. Hey everyone, I'm Phil Albertelli, the host of The Week in Doubt, a podcast for atheists, agnostics, and whoever. So I'm trying to think if there's any shout-outs to take care of. I don't think so. Um, but then again, friend and listener Matthew Sharnweber did generously increase his monthly Patreon pledge, which is much appreciated. Don't know if he wants me uh, disclosing that on the air or not. Well, technically, this is a pre-recorded show, but you get my drift. Uh, so maybe I'll take this moment to give a shout-out to Matthew and everyone else who supports the show via Patreon. Greatly appreciated. So I wanted to do something special for Easter, which reminds me I still have to publish a TWID replay of at least one of the past Easter specials. And I have a bunch of old show ideas just kind of hanging around in the back closet of my mind, so to speak. And one of them has to do with this idea that it was women who discovered the empty tomb in the Gospels. And how Christian apologists use this as an example of what's referred to, I believe, as an argument from embarrassment. And the thinking behind this argument goes, why would an author go out of their way to include something fabricated or made up that would serve only to embarrass them? Thusly, if if a story or an account includes something that would be embarrassing to the author that means it's likely that it's historically accurate. That's the thinking, anyway. And given the status of women in much of the ancient world, including ancient Palestine or ancient Jewish society or culture, where their witness testimony, perhaps, wouldn't have been considered as being equal to that of a man, why would you make up this embarrassing element of the story that it was women who discovered the empty tomb of the risen Messiah. And so I always felt that this would be a really interesting argument to tackle. And since it is Holy Week, well, agnostic atheist here, but still Holy Week, I guess. I was raised Catholic and I still like to celebrate Easter, etc. That I thought this would make for a good Easter episode. And so I was thinking about it today, and just as a layman, This idea popped into my head, and I don't know how much water it holds or not, but couldn't have been the case that they have the women discovering the empty tomb because they're trying to continue that humility theme. Uh, I mean, already you have Jesus dying this very undignified death, executed by crucifixion like a criminal, when traditionally... The Jews had envisioned the Messiah as this conquering hero akin to David. And so I was thinking to myself that maybe this is another area where the narrative gets kind of turned on its head and you don't get what you expected. Instead of the Messiah coming as a conquering warrior king, you get someone who was mocked, humiliated, stripped and executed as a criminal. And maybe... In keeping with that theme of humility and of a Messiah who ministered to the downtrodden and the quote-unquote least of these, um, maybe to help illustrate that yet again, you have women, people who were considered being of lesser status at the time, discovering the empty tomb of the risen Messiah. But I don't want to rush to congratulate myself because as well and good as all that sounds, I think there might be a much simpler explanation. And that's that traditionally it was the role of women to tend to the bodies of the dead. And here's a little bit from a website called Women in the Bible. And I found this via a Patheos article And so it says it was the women's task to prepare a dead body for burial. Tombs were visited and watched for three days by family members. On the third day after death, the body was examined. On these occasions, the body would be treated by the women of the family with oils and perfumes. The women's visit to the tombs of Jesus and Lazarus are connected with this ritual. And this brings me to something really interesting that I think I already knew but had forgotten. And rediscovered while researching this episode, this concept of the myrrh bearers. 
And this refers to the women that came to tend to Jesus' body with um, spices, oils, perfumes, that kind of thing. And myrrh, I believe, is this kind of natural uh, gum or resin. And uh, it, it was used in the ancient world as incense, as a kind of perfume, etc. And of course, it was supposedly one of the gifts that was given to the infant Jesus. And sometimes there's actually men that are included among the myrrh bearers too. Um, for instance, Nicodemus and of course, Joseph of Arimathea. Both men, I believe, were thought to have been members of the Sanhedrin. And Joseph of Arimathea, of course, is the one who supposedly offered his new unused tomb as a place to house the body of Jesus. Let's see, here's a uh, William Lane Craig quote I found. And he says, The discovery of the tomb by women is highly probable given the low status of women in Jewish society and their lack of qualification to serve as legal witnesses. The most plausible explanation why women and not the male disciples were made discoverers of the empty tomb is that the women were in fact the ones who made this discovery. And if you're not familiar, William Lane Craig is this kind of notorious Christian apologist. And I say notorious because... If you're a non-believer like myself, you know, skeptic, atheist, whatever you want to call yourself, and like me, you've glutted yourself on YouTube atheist versus theist debates, you're probably well aware of William Lane Craig and have seen him debate the likes of the late Christopher Hitchens, uh, Sam Harris, etc. So it seems kind of weird to me in light of the fact that supposedly, traditionally, it was the role of women to tend to the bodies of the dead and to check on the bodies on the third day, etc., that uh, you'd go out of your way to reach for this argument from embarrassment. Isn't a simpler explanation that, well, women would have been expected to be there? But I guess if you're trying to proselytize or convert people, uh, that's not quite as powerful as saying, see, it must have been true because people will have been embarrassed to include it, you know? But once again, if this idea that it was the role of women traditionally to tend to the bodies of the dead, to be there on the third day, etc., if that's all correct, then wouldn't that be something you'd expect to be included in the story, and why would that be seen as a point of embarrassment? I mean, I get it that the resurrection is supposed to be such a special world-changing event that Christians would probably prefer that someone of higher status, that one of the, you know, one or more of the important apostles would have been there to witness the empty tomb, or to meet Jesus first, post-resurrection. But I imagine if you're writing a story and you want it to have some sense of reality, um, you'd probably think to yourself, okay, so what would happen normally? You know, what would the normal unfolding of events be? Well, if you have this person who died and they're in a tomb, you would have women come intend to the body, uh, female relatives, or etc., uh, checking on the body on the third day. And uh, so maybe just try to put myself in the head of an ancient author. You know, they would have drawn from tradition and tried to include these kind of, I don't know if mundane's the right word, but these elements that, that you would expect, like female relatives visiting the tomb, etc., and then they go, okay, so now how do we get from here to the apostles finding out about the resurrection? And so it goes from, you know, the women were the ones who happened to be at the tomb, so they're the ones who have to inform the apostles. And if you're a believer listening to this, you might be offended by the way I seem to be talking about this story as if it's uh, some piece of contrived fiction or whatever. And it's actually not my intent to try to offend anyone. And if you're a regular listener of the show, then you know I've said uh, numerous times that I kind of straddle the fence when it comes to the question of the historicity of Jesus. 
Because looking at it from what I hope is a fairly objective, yet admittedly skeptical, yet relatively open-minded point of view, that I could easily believe or, or be receptive to the idea that there was a historical Jesus, someone who walked the earth 2,000 years ago, some kind of charismatic teacher or preacher who gained a following. I can, I, I'm definitely willing to believe that. Uh, trying to convince me that he walked on water and rose from the dead is uh, a whole nother thing. But uh, but so I don't have any big issues with that. I'm open to being convinced that that was the case. But I'm also somewhat receptive to the idea that he may have been a composite figure or maybe even like what the mythicists argue. He um, may have been based on earlier dying and rising god myths or something like that. And so I, I'm open to being convinced either way. And who knows, maybe it's a bit of both. Maybe there was one or more historical figures he was based on, and then that also got mixed up with uh, neighboring dying and rising god traditions and stories about dramas in the lower heavens like uh, Richard Carrier talks about, etc. Who the hell knows? And it's so hard to try to reach back through the fog of time and pin down what actually happened. Because I'm sure the story of Jesus was kept alive via oral tradition before it was ever written down. And then that we know that the gospel accounts differ to some degree. Of course, we have the three synoptics, meaning to see alike, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, but even they differ to some degree. But then you have John, which differs the most. And um, I think as Dominic Crossan talks about, and I've often talked about Dominic Crossan on the show, and how he talks about this misconception we have that the people who wrote the Gospels were trying for what we would see in the modern world as journalistic accuracy that they were probably more concerned of trying to convey what they saw as the truth, the message of the story, and weren't as concerned with getting everything 100% historically accurate. They were trying to transmit a message, the good news, the gospel, and the story or their account was the vehicle for that. And what's that quote I love by Crossan? I'll probably butcher it. Uh, I've been paraphrasing it on the show since almost day one, I think. But he, the way he put it was that it's either the case that the gospel writers meant for the text to be taken literally, and we're so smart now we know to take them figuratively, or that they intended for them to some degree to be taken figuratively, and we're so dumb we insist on taking them literally. And he says he believes it's the latter, you know, <laughs> and so do I. Because as he points out, people at the time didn't really seem to have a big issue with the fact that the gospel accounts differed. And they didn't mind putting these different accounts side by side together in the same book, you know. And in fairness, there are Christians who seem very accepting of the fact that the gospel accounts differ and who will even try to put that forward as evidence of the authenticity of the text, arguing that if these events really happened and you had different people writing about them based on maybe different eyewitness accounts, not saying that the gospels were eyewitness accounts, some apologists do try to drag things as far back as they can to try to get them there, the eyewitness period, you know, but that these stories kept alive by oral tradition may have been based on actual eyewitness accounts. Then you have different people writing about them. You'd expect them to differ, you know, and in fairness, I think that makes sense. But if you're the type of Christian who wants to believe that the Bible is is the inerrant, infallible word of God, then you got some splaining to do. And attempting to harmonize the different accounts is only going to take you so far. Well, hopefully I don't 
bore you guys with this next part, but I was thinking uh, it might be fun to do a little bit of like a Sunday school thing. You know, I'm all ready for that. I'm drinking my uh, crack and rum and Coke. <laughs> um, it's a Friday night. Good Friday. I think, yeah, I had sausage pizza today. Frozen Papaginos. I wasn't trying to intentionally desecrate the sanctity of the day. Uh, <laughs> I, I really, it really just slipped my mind. Um, not that it would have stopped me anyway. Once again, agnostic atheist, even though I was raised Catholic. I'm just saying that uh, my, my sacrilege was not intentional. But I thought it would be interesting to actually read the actual gospel accounts of the discovery of the empty tomb. And uh, usually, traditionally, the order of the Gospels goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, even though Mark, I believe, is actually the oldest. I think it's it's Mark that ends with the empty tomb, right? Had that kind of dark ending. Um, says something about, you know, they discovered the empty tomb and they were afraid or something like that. And then later, uh, scribes would add an additional ending to kind of make things end on a lighter note, I guess. Um, but yeah, I'll start with Matthew. And I believe this is the King James Version. And many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph. I think Joseph or Joses is a form of the name Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. When the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulchre. Now the next day that followed, the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while well, he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command therefore that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as ye can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him the keepers did shake, and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. And before I move on to the next account, I notice that uh, Matthew talks about the day of preparation. And this is where things really get kind of messy and confusing. Are they talking about preparation for Passover or preparation for the Sabbath? Or is the preparation they're mentioning referring to something to do with the body? I don't know. Uh, traditionally, the story goes that you know, Jesus was crucified on Friday and they had to hurry to get him entombed because the following day would have been the Jewish Sabbath and no work is permitted on the Sabbath. And of course, when we talk about Thursday or Friday or what, you know, we throw these words around, these are Anglo-Saxon words, obviously not ancient uh, Hebraic words. Um, most of our weekdays are Anglo-Saxon words, the etymology of which can be traced back to the names of uh, Norse gods. Thursday, Thor's Day, um, I believe Friday is named for Frigg or Frigga, um, Odin's wife in Norse mythology. Wednesday is Odin's Day. Uh, Tuesday is Tears Day, I believe. 
But according to tradition, Jesus was crucified on what would be to us Friday. And then the Sabbath would have followed. And then the beginning of the new week, the day of resurrection. And as I've talked about a lot on the show in the past, when I try to illustrate the inconsistencies or the contradictions between the different gospel accounts, I talk about how one of the biggest ones is probably that John has Jesus dying on a different day in the sense that according to the synoptics, it looks like the Passover meal, the last supper is eaten on Thursday And then Jesus is crucified on Friday. Whereas in the Gospel of John, Jesus dies on the day of Passover during the day when the Passover meal will have been eaten or celebrated that night. And many think that this is John kind of taking artistic license to make the point that Jesus is the lamb who will die for the sins of the world. Jesus is being crucified as the lambs are being slaughtered in preparation for the Passover meal that will take place later that night. And I have heard biblical scholars actually describe it as John has Jesus dying on a different day. But from what I can tell, in general, in all the accounts, he seems to be dying, I think, on Friday, except John has Passover taking place on Friday, where it's taking place the day before in the synoptics. But then if you research it online, supposedly there may be accounts where Jesus actually does die on a, uh, on a day other than Friday. So it gets very confusing. But the time of day that the crucifixion takes place definitely does vary between accounts. But I guess I'll continue with Mark. There were also women looking on afar off, among whom was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the Less. And according to tradition, I believe James the Less was thought to be the, uh, the, the literal brother of the Lord, the biological brother of Jesus Christ. So Mary the mother of James the Less and of Joseph and Salome, who also when he was in Galilee followed him and ministered unto him, and many other women which came up with him unto Jerusalem. And now when the even was come, because it was the preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, so clearly that would have been Friday, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled if he were already dead and calling unto him the centurion. He asked him whether he had been any while dead. And when he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph, and he bought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen, and laid him in a sepulchre which was hewn out of a rock, and rolled a stone unto the door of the sepulchre. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph beheld where he was laid. And when the Sabbath was past, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had bought sweet spices, that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment. And they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted, ye see Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way and tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulchre, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him, as they mourned and wept. And if you remember in Matthew's account, the messenger is described as an angel of the Lord, who rolls aside the stone blocking the sepulcher, and actually sits on top of the stone. And here they see a young man inside the sepulcher, sitting down. So a bit of a difference there already. All right, so I guess Luke is next. And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just. The same had not consented to the counsel and deed of them. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. This man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. 
and he took it down and wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a sepulchre that was hewn in stone, wherein never man before was laid. And that day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew on. And the women also which came with him from Galilee followed after, and beheld the sepulchre and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments, and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words, and returned from the sepulchre, and told all these things unto the eleven, and to all the rest. So there in this third account, we have two men. Well, the first account, we have an angel who sits on top of the stone that was previously blocking the entrance of the sepulchre. The next account, we have a young man inside the tomb, and now we have two men standing by the women, maybe outside the tomb. I'm back through the magic of editing. I already uploaded this episode to Podbean, but I just caught my mistake listening back. It should have been pretty clear if I had been listening to what I was reading the first time that says they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. It came to pass as they were much perplexed there about, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. So these two men, these two angelic messengers, whatever they are, they're not outside. They're clearly inside the sepulcher. Now back to me. So two individuals this time, asexual reproduction, he split like an amoeba. Just kidding. So finally, let's see what John has to say. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave, and came therefore and took the body of Jesus. It should be noted, I think it's been said by biblical scholars before, that there seems to be this increasingly hostile tone towards the quote-unquote Jews that we find throughout the Gospels. And I'm sure this probably helped fuel or was partly responsible for this ugly tradition of anti-Semitism among Christians towards Jews, Jews being depicted as, you know, quote unquote, Christ killers and all this. When ironically, of course, Jesus was Jewish. His disciples, his apostles were Jewish. Uh, the masses he would have been preaching to would have been Jewish. Um... I think as some biblical scholars have said, you know, it shouldn't be seen as a condemnation of the Jews as a people, but it's more or most a kind of familial infighting. Uh, even, I think with the exception of Luke, it's thought that Luke was a Gentile or that maybe he could have been a Hellenized Jew, uh, but it's thought that the other apostle writers were themselves Jewish and the first Christians were uh, all Jewish, of course. And in fact, in the early days of Christianity, Gentiles who wanted to be Christians had to kind of first convert to Judaism. Um, and there was a, a debate in the Jesus movement over whether or not Gentiles should be bound by Jewish dietary restrictions, whether they should be circumcised, etc. All right, but back to John. And there came also Nicodemus, which at first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen cloths with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulchre wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulchre was right at hand. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. So it must have been uh, John, right? Yeah, John, the beloved disciple. 
and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulchre. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying, yet went not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went to the sepulchre, and seeth the linen cloths lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but wrapped together in a place by itself. And it's funny they mention a, a napkin, which must have been the cloth that supposedly covered uh, Jesus' face or head. And I've talked about the, um, the Shroud of Turin on the uh, show before. I think in the early days of the show, I did a couple of specials on it. And there's another relic called the... Uh, the Sudarium of Oviedo, I think. And uh, I think it's in Spain. And it's purported to be something similar to the Shroud of Turin, but it's supposed to be this cloth that we hear about in John that was covering the face. And it bears these stains that supposedly, according to some, match up with uh, the blood stains or whatever on the Shroud of Turin. But I will say, in fairness to Christians, uh, there are a lot of things that sync up among the stories as well, you know. So some of the differences might not be huge, but still, if you're someone who chooses to believe in this stuff literally, uh, I don't know how you uh, work all that out. I mean, was the messenger an angel who came down from heaven, rolled the stone away, and actually sat on top of it? Was the messenger a young man who may or may not have been angelic in nature, sitting inside the tomb, or was it two men outside the tomb or whatever, you know? So back once again through the magic of editing. And once again, yes, the two men or these two angelic figures were inside the tomb. And there's also two figures inside the tomb in uh, John's account as well. And while I'm here anyway, clarifying or correcting things, I should also say that it seems pretty clear for the most part that when... All the gospel accounts are talking about the day of preparation or whatever, uh, that they're talking about, it would seem to me, the Friday before the Sabbath, when everything needs to be taken care of because you weren't allowed to work on the Sabbath. But I think a couple of things confuse me. One is, during my research for this episode, I did read about these different interpretations of what exactly day of preparation meant in certain contexts. And then I found the wording in Matthew, in the King James Version at least, a little odd or confusing. So if I go back and revisit Matthew for a second, they're talking about the body being laid in the tomb. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Now the next day that followed, the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate. So the way I was interpreting that at first, it confused me because I thought they were saying the next day after they had placed the body in the sepulcher was the day of preparation, which didn't make sense to me because the day of preparation will have been Friday, the day of the crucifixion. But I think what they're saying is the Pharisees or the high priests or and or approach Pilate actually on the Sabbath. That's what it seems like to me. But anyway, back to me once again. I don't know. Some of the stuff you could probably try to harmonize the way the accounts differ in the number of Marys or the number of women you can probably say, oh, well, they, they may have been there in the other accounts, but they just weren't mentioned. You know what I mean? But as I said earlier, I think harmonization or attempts at harmonization only get you so far. All right, but I'm feeling kind of wiped, so I guess I'll call this episode a wrap. Uh, thanks for listening, everyone. You guys know the drill. Please like the Facebook page. You can follow the show on Twitter. You can check out the YouTube channel. If you want to help the show out monetarily, you can go to patreon.com slash theweekendout and help the show out for as little as 99 cents a month and quit anytime you want. All right, brothers and sisters, until next time. <laughs>